Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Uh, At an old (laughs) United Methodist uh, camp uh, called Camp Galilee uh, in Missouri, uh, there was a water station in the middle of camp, uh, with, and both sides were etched uh, with that verse, with anybody who comes to this well and drinks shall never be thirsty again, uh, except that Camp Galilee is on uh, a sulfur line. Uh, and if you've had or been around sulfur water, uh, the water coming out of the fountain above which was sketched Anyone who comes to me will never thirst again. Smelled like rotten eggs. Uh, I think that was was the first time I experienced irony in my life and like really knew what what it was. Like this is funny. It says this is living water and it tastes like poop. Like I, I put that together for the first time in my life that there was such a thing as irony. Uh, I don't know what uh, your cultural reference is for people who hate each other. Um, some of you who are smarter than the rest of us might be thinking of the Capulets and the Montagues. Uh, down there at the left, uh, some of you are, who are older than the rest of us are thinking of the Hatfields and the McCoys. Those are the Hatfields down there in that corner there. Then, then the, you know, there's us who think of Romulans, obviously, and the, and the human beings in Star Trek. Or maybe your reference is uh, Death Row Records and Bad Boy Entertainment. Two groups of people who are known for hating each other. Like that's their identity as cultures. That's Jews from Jerusalem and Samaritans. They're both Jewish people. They're both Yahweh followers. They're both descendants that can trace back to Jacob. We heard in the story that this was the place, this was Jacob's well, that this was the land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. That Joseph is the one with the coat of many colors from uh, from Donny Osmond. That's a dated reference there too. Uh, Donny Osmond was the Joseph in in the green color on Broadway. So we have to go back to Old Testament stuff. We have to go back to Game of Thrones Israel stuff to really understand what's happening with the Samaritans and the Israelites. Okay, so for a, a brief time, Israel is, is one kingdom, right? Un, most notably united under King Solomon. 
You know that name. Uh, the wisdom of Solomon, Solomon's temple, cut the baby in half, Solomon, right? He ruled a, a, an Israel that was united, that was one kingdom, that was one state. And of course, when Solomon died, the sons couldn't agree on who gets to be king. And so one of them took the northern kingdom, and one of them took the southern kingdom. And they split. That was the first division between the Israelites and the Samaritans. Jerusalem, I think I can have a, yeah, look at that. Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom in Judah. And Samaria becomes the capital of the northern kingdom. That's the first time they figure out that they are different from each other, Samaritans and Israelites. But, of course, to make Samaria a capital, you have to make it a, a cultural center and a religious center. And the Samaritans set up a temple in, in Samaria, their capital city. But, of course, Jerusalem is the only place that you can build a temple. Jerusalem is the only place that Hebrews can worship God and Yahweh in a temple. And so that was the second division. The Samaritans had the gall to build themselves a temple in their capital city. And then the Assyrians came in. The Assyrians are not on this map. Okay, they're over here. But they come in and they take over Judah, the southern kingdom. And they pretty much leave the northern kingdom alone, which just bugs the southern kingdom, kingdom to no end. Right? That was it. That's the final straw. The Israelites and the Samaritans are divided from that point on. And instead of abating over time, that animosity between them just grew and, and deepened and strengthened for generations. By the time of Jesus, even though the north and south kingdoms of Israel were pretty much just, just in name only, just in culture, and it was all Rome by the time Jesus came along. It was all the Roman Empire. The Rome didn't care about the northern and the southern kingdom. But they were still divided in culture. They were still divided in religion. They were still uh, divided socially. Jews and Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. They weren't violent enemies. They, they, they respected their roots in Jacob enough. But there was religious and cult it was against religious law and cultural law for Jews to sit down with Samaritans. They had nothing to do with each other. So when Jesus tells a story about a, a man who was beaten and robbed and left for dead on the side of a road, and a Jewish priest comes by and crosses the road and passes the man on the other side, and a Levite comes by, in other words, a, a, a member of the tribe, one of us, walks by and passes the man. And a Samaritan man stops and helps him and goes beyond helping him. All of this is behind that story that Jesus tells. Jesus does not say on purpose who the beaten man was or whether he was a Jew from Jerusalem or a Samaritan from Samaria. He was just a, a human being in need. And Jesus asks, which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man? Religion says it was the priest. Culture says it was the Levite. But action said it was the one who showed him mercy. And the Gospel of John tells us a story that goes deeper than that. We get a one-on-one a -on -one conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan Samaritan woman at a well in Samaria. But we have to finish the story first. Uh, I, I stopped, I didn't let, I didn't want Margaret to have to read the whole thing. Uh, there's a lot more. <laughs> so after she says, uh, give me this water, sir. Give me this water to drink. I absolutely love, you don't even have a bucket. That's like, that's my favorite line of the story. Um, this is the, this is a, a part in um, the Gospel of John where Jesus is just going around confusing people, right? We read Nicodemus last week, and Jesus is like, you have to be born again, which just confuses Nicodemus to no end. 
And now she says, you don't even have a bucket. Where are you getting this water? So Jesus demonstrates that he knows this woman's heart, and he demonstrates his divine knowledge by telling her, a stranger that she has just met, go get your husband and have him join the conversation. And she says, I don't have one. And he says, you're right, you don't. You've had five, and now you don't. So the woman, I feel bad having to call her that, but she is not named uh, in the story. I'll call her Sam for Samaritan. We'll go with that. She acknowledges that Jesus is a prophet, and, and he, she brings up the past between Samaritans uh, and, and Israelites. And she brings up, this is Jacob's well. This is a, a part of the problem. You're not even supposed to be here. How are we talking? And Jesus says, believe me, there's pretty soon nobody's going to care which mountain you're on to worship. We will worship in spirit and truth from our heart. And the woman proclaims her hope that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus runs and tells her village that she has met the Messiah. The disciples show up and get all upset that Jesus is even talking to this woman. But nobody says anything to Jesus. And this Samaritan woman, who Jesus isn't even supposed to be talking to in the first place, tells her city about it, and they go and follow Jesus. Uh, Missouri has the uh, honor of being the first state in the Union uh, to have a travel warning issued against it by its local NAACP. Last year, Missouri passed a bill into law that, that raises, raises the legal burden necessary to, uh, to, to file lawsuits against businesses for discrimination purposes to, to levels that no one under experiencing that discrimination would ever be able to pass. In response to that, our state NAACP issued, issued a travel warning for the state of Missouri and the National Convention of NAACP officially recognized it. The first time ever. Yay. The NAACP has officially warned discriminated groups not to come through Missouri because their civil rights are more likely to be violated here than any other state. Uh, Samaria had a travel warning on it. You didn't go through. You followed the river. This is the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus is from. Capernaum and, and all Nazareth and all the places that he got his disciples and he gathered the fishermen. This is the Sea of Galilee. So from the Sea of Galilee down to the, to the Dead Sea and Jerusalem, this was traveled. Uh, but you went around to Samaria. But it was quicker to go this way. So Jesus just walked straight through. Because, you know, that's Jesus. But entering Samaria itself, let alone talking to this woman, let alone talking to a woman, entering Samaria was a statement by Jesus. Jesus is, is turning cultural norms and breaking the law by doing so. This conversation of living water should not be happening. Not just the subject matter, not what they were talking about, but the fact that they were talking should not have happened. It was against the rules of the church. It was against the laws of Jerusalem. It was against the norms of the culture. And we're going to work on the content of this conversation, but I want us to know we have to understand that the conversation itself is content. It matters that Jesus sat down and talked with a Samaritan. It matters that Jesus sat down and talked with a woman. Most of the time we, fo we, we focus on that cultural clash. And we talk about how brave Jesus is for sitting down with this woman. This woman is just as brave. Sam is just as at risk in this situation as Jesus is. 
because Jesus is not an Israelite first. Jesus is a man first. Sam can get stoned for talking to Jesus in public. So we do all sorts of things to work our way around that. We talk about her five husbands and how she must have been a black widow at the, at the most, right? Like bad luck to husbands. Uh, but also, you know, that's a lot of husbands to have. And so men <laughs> sit down and they write about the scriptures and they talk about how terrible this woman was. But you all know about the marriage law, right, with the brothers. She had five husbands. She probably married one and then lo- and lost him and then what by Jewish law was married to the younger brother and then so on and so on and so forth. And maybe this sixth one was like ten, right? I mean, we don't know why she had five husbands. We don't know why she is currently not married. But we do everything we can to take her power away out of this story. She is just as outside her cultural norms than Jesus is. She is just, she is more at risk than Jesus is in this situation. And she becomes, in the Gospel of John, the first Christian evangelist. She is so moved by her sit down with Jesus, by her conversation, that she goes and tells the whole town, and she gives people in her town and around Jacob's well, the hope to go and to hear and to follow and to learn at Jesus' feet. They come back at the end of the story and say, we believed you, but we no longer believe just because you told us. We we saw it. (laughs) We heard it. We believe because we have seen it. But I have to wonder about what it was exactly that got this woman so excited. In the Gospel of John, in in the text in front of us, it says that it's because Jesus told her things about herself that he could not have known. There's a supernatural bent to it. This is the part of the Gospel of John where Jesus walks around confusing individuals. Nicodemus says, and Nick is is so adorable, Nicodemus. He's like, I just, I can't, it's not like I can, you know, go back in and get born again, right? Like. And she says, you don't even have a bucket. Where are you getting this water? What are you talking about? Right? They're all, they're all still on the literal level. They're all still on, on getting born a second time physically. And you, you have no way of carrying water. You have no way of getting water. This well is too deep. What, what are you talking about? I can give you water and you will never thirst again. You have access to my living waters. The word used in the original Greek, uh, it meant something like the pure water of life. We're not talking about well water here. We're talking about spring water. And after she says that Jesus doesn't even have a bucket, and they get around to the idea that Jesus isn't talking about actual literal water, the woman says, sir, give me this so I don't have to come here anymore. (laughs) Right? She's still on a literal level. And we get to this part where Jesus asks her, go get your husband, bring him in to the conversation. I would like to talk to him. Talk to him. She says she doesn't have a husband. Jesus says, no, you don't. Right? But you've had five and you're not now. And, she, and, and, and we get the idea that he says more about her life uh, than just the husband part. And she's amazed and she goes and she declares out loud, the first person in the Gospel of John, she declares out loud that she believes Jesus is the Messiah. Now I don't know about you, but this is a little bit too much for me. Uh, This is a little uh, parlor tricky. This is a little bit too fortune teller Jesus for me. I mean, I know, I know, I know that God knows me better than I know myself, and I and I know that God has uh, God has formed me together in my inward parts. But I don't, but I don't see Jesus sitting down at a table and just like pu- pulling out, "Is this your card?" Like just to prove that He's the Messiah. So what I'm trying to get past the 
I'm trying to get underneath the, the gospel genre writing here. Because we all know that, that the gospel writers had a certain literary style in which they were writing. They, were, they had a biased, persuasive objective. They wanted to present a, a story, a complete story that told the divinity of Jesus Christ. And when we read underneath that, what happens here is that they just connect as, as one human being to another human being. The power behind the calling of the first Christian evangelist in the Gospel of John is a man who listened. Jesus listens to her. Jesus hears her story. The eternal living waters this person wanted and and responded to was just being known and seen and heard, being recognized. The first Christian message in the world is this guy gets me. He listens, he's present, he remembers. Sometimes I think that's the only thing that every human being in the world has in common. We all just want to be heard. We all just want to be seen and and known. That's all of any of us really want. That's the basic foundation of every struggle for civil rights that has ever been. See us. Know us. And our struggles. In this moment at the well where Jacob's own family got their water, Jesus offers the Samaritan woman simple recognition and acknowledgement of what she's been through. Supernatural or not, he says, you've, you've had quite a life. And that loving attention changed her. Water means something to us. We're, we come from it. <laughs> We're made from it. We die without it. Different things happen to our bodies without water than, than happen to our bodies without food. We dry up from the inside. If we don't get enough of it, if we don't get it enough of it for a long, um, long enough amount of time, our systems can't work. They just stop. And water speaks to me. Uh, my, my family lived on, on, the, on the lake of the Ozarks when I was born. And I, I'm pretty sure I was in the lake before I walked. Moving water tells me about persistence and motion, and staying in motion, and, and focus. Just keep, just keep flowing downstream. Just keep flowing. Something gets in your way, sometimes you can just move around it. Sometimes you can move around it like on all sides, right? All the way around it. Sometimes you can work your way underneath it. And it, if you're really, really patient, you can just go through it, right? Like millions of years patient. But you can just eventually just run right through the thing. Sometimes you can just move the river. This is a bridge in Honduras that was across that river. Then the rains came and the monsoons came and the floods came and the river moved. And now there's this bridge down here that's just over nothing. Sometimes you can just move the water. <laughs> Standing deep water speaks to me. Still water speaks to me. Not just the piece on top, but, but all of the activity underneath the piece on top that makes the piece on top possible. 
still waters run deep. But underneath that, there's stability and, and power underneath that. So in one of Jesus' many metaphors for the spiritual awakening that he was offering the world, one of, one of the, the things that Jesus hit on over and over and over again was that he was, he was offering a living water that would quench thirst for all eternity. One drink and you'll never be thirsty again. So what is your soul thirsting for? Because being thirsty is different from being hungry, isn't it? Oftentimes we talk about them together, but it's, it's a different situation. It's a different sensation. It feels different. Being hungry is, is down here. I feel like being thirsty is like here. And it's a different solution. We can live different times without one or the other. Right? So we often, we talk about them together, but being thirsty is different. What is your soul thirsting for this week? Amen.